Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks everyone for uh, coming on Friday afternoon. It's a such a nice weather. I suppose to <laughs> go out and enjoy the weather. Um, so thanks very much uh, for attending the, um, today's talk. Uh, so um, the, over the past uh, 15 or so years, we have been working on uh, image quality assessment and various applications based on uh, image quality assessment. So over the years, uh, before I go to my talk, I need to thank all these collaborators I've been working with, uh, many, many fantastic people. So they are, uh, without them, I cannot um, get all the results we have so far. Uh, specific, I want to thank all the past my and current students of, of mine. And currently, uh, we have a research group of um, four postdocs and five PhD students and a few um, master students in, in the lab. Okay, so I always want to start with this um, as a motivating example. Here I'm showing six versions of the Einstein image. The, the top left is the original Einstein image. At the same time, I'm showing um, five altered versions of Einstein image. There's one thing in common of these five images. If you take any one of these images and you can comp compute the mean squared error of this image against the reference, the original image, then you will get almost the same mean squared error. Right? So, but if you're working in the field of image and video processing, uh, you know that most of the um, algorithm systems uh, are compiled using mean squared error to say which one give better result. And uh, even worse, most of these algorithm systems are designed to optimize mean squared error. But if you look at these images, the top image, images uh, with contrast change and luminance change, they look pretty good, pretty okay. The bottom images, uh, indeed the, the bottom left, the JPEG compressed image, image, heavily compressed. That has the lowest mean square error of the five. In other words, mean square error would say that the, the bottom left has the best quality. So uh, from this motivating example, easily you can see uh, what we really need is, is a different objective image quality measure that can really predict how humans think, think about the quality of all these images. So this is basically the, the purpose uh, of image quality assessment research. The goal is to automatically predict perceived image quality. And over the years, there have been a lot of uh, papers published in the field uh, if you look at the literature, we can trace back at least to 40 years ago, or even more than that. So uh, if you look at all these algorithms proposed so far, you have different ways to classify them. The first uh, simple way to do this is, uh, is this full reference, no reference, and reduced reference uh, classification. So in this case, uh, basically all the algorithms depending on whether you're making use of the reference original image or not. So for example, in the previous example, if you are using the original reference Einstein image as a reference, you assume that has a perfect quality. Then this is called a full reference quality assessment. Uh, for humans, most of the time, you don't even need to look at the original image. Uh, that's actually the no reference quality assessment uh, case. In that case, you don't have the reference to look at. There's something in between, and this is um, an area that coming uh, directly from the industry. So uh, in industry, there are use, use cases that you don't have the, 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 the full access to the reference image, but you might get a chance to extract certain features from the reference image. And then when you evaluate the uh, quality of the distorted image, the altered image, you can, uh, instead of looking at the full reference, you can look at these features extracted from those uh, references. This is uh, called uh, reduced reference quality assessment. And there are also other ways. So for example, uh, if you uh, design an algorithm that is uh, working only for some specific applications. So for example, you all only want to evaluate images compressed by JPEG. Then you can design a specific algorithm. This is what we call uh, uh, occasion-specific algorithm. But if you are designing something just like what, how we use misread error in the previous uh, slide, uh, you are basically applying the same approach to all kinds of distortions. This is what we call the general purpose approaches. So with these two kinds of ways to classify uh, this algorithm, basically you can put uh, uh, this algorithm into many, many categories. And over the past um, 
40 years, and especially uh, over the past about 15 years, this area getting extremely hot. So you, you see maybe most of the papers published in the past 10 years uh, instead of uh, the time before that, this is getting a really, really hot area. Okay, so um, probably we don't have the time. Um, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this, you, you, you can look at some survey papers, uh, but today we don't have time to go through all these methods people have been proposed. But uh, here I want to just want to summarize the general philosophy, the general approaches that people have been using and they make sense. They really improve our capability of pr predicting human perception of image quality. So uh, you have models based on uh, psycholo psychological models, based on neuroscience models. So this is the first type of um, models. Uh, if you go to the vision literature, neuroscience literature, you'll find a lot of papers and many of the computation models can be extracted and converted into some engineering solution so that you can have a computer, you write a program, you implement that, you can compute something. So there are quite many models that work pretty well. So in the past uh, several, uh, more than 10 years, we have these um, structural similarity method. This is something that we proposed before. It's getting really, really popular. So probably after this slide, I'm gonna give a little bit, a brief introduction of this particular approach. And other than that, um, you also have a lot of successful approaches based on natural thing statistics. Um, uh, the, the motivation behind these approaches is that you look at um, big volumes of uh, natural images and video signals. You're trying to do sta uh, have statistical model of natural images instead of the human brain. You are trying to uh, have models of natural images. The, the underlying assumption is that the human brain is highly adapted to the, to, the, to the visual world. So that if you can have a good model of the, of the uh, natural thing, then this will also predict how humans think about uh, image quality. Basically the assumption is if image looks more natural, probably also has better quality. And based on that, you can see a lot of natural thing statistics and uh, information theoretical approaches. Uh, they are also very successful uh, uh, at predicting uh, image quality. And in the past few years, you also have this visual attention model. I think uh, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this because Han Tao is an expert in this area. He will talk, talk to you about how this visual attention model can help you improve image quality assessment. And uh, in the past few years, there, there are also this, uh, a lot of machine learning people, probably a lot of people here are working on machine learning. And uh, we do have machine learning people in the past several years uh, get into the area and they improve the performance a lot. Okay, so these are basically the general um, me methodologies people have been using that really make sense to improve um, image quality assessment. And we also, in the past uh, several years, uh, the performance um, of predicting image quality also improved a lot. Right? So uh, this is not like um, 15 years ago when I, uh, about that time I started to work on image quality assessment. Um, Basically, you can propose different models, but it's really hard to uh, validate those models and to compare these model, models. These days, uh, you can find, easily find a lot of um, public, public databases on the internet. People have done this experiment. They have collected a lot of images. They, they ask humans to look at these images, and you got I mean opinion scores for each of the images. So you do have something to use to compare and to improve. Right, so, and uh, over the past, especially over the past few years, and people have got, got extremely high, good performance. So, I would say remarkable performance, but uh, I, I, I put a quotation mark there because uh, there are also quite a lot of people started, started to question all this performance because you, you can see in recent papers, people, people got correlation of 0 0.9, 0 0.95 uh, with between human scores and objective um, model scores. And this, are these real or not? Uh, I believe it's, it's a little bit, um, probably is some overfitting or people, uh, especially machine learning people have been playing with this data, this database is online uh, too, too hard. Um, so uh, people start to question about this, uh, whether these models can really generalize to the general case. And uh, it, based on some recent study we, we have done, and this is probably the case. Um, uh, the, the real world, when you work with a lot of images extracted from the uh, real world, the problem is way more complicated than what you can, uh, you can work on with these uh, existing databases. Anyway, anyway so um, 
at least we achieve something good. So I, I'm going to stop uh, uh, about the comments about these um, uh, fields. Uh, instead, I'm going to go with uh, some specific approaches. So structural similarity index is something that I uh, proposed. Uh, we published paper in 2004, and this is becoming the most cited paper in, in the area. So the, the basic assumption in this approach is very, very simple. The, so the basic, very funda fundamental assumption is that uh, the purpose of vision uh, is to extract structural information from the visual field. So basically the question is what's, what's the goal of having eyes, right? So why we need to have eyes? The major purpose, of course there could be some other reason to, to, be, to, be, uh, to look good, uh, that's probably one reason. But the, the most important reason to have eyes is that we want to extract uh, structural information from the visual scene, right? So we come into the room, we need to know there's a chair here, there's, an, there's a desk over there. Uh, what's the, the relationship between them? We want to explore this structural information in, in the real world, right? So if this is the main purpose of vision, then any distortion that mess up with this, right? So this is what we would call the structural distortion that would be something really annoying. So we don't like that. We're going to give very low score if for, for, for images that has this structural distortion. On the other hand, if you have non-structural distortion, maybe it's not so objection. Right? So, object, so, so you don't have to um, give big penalty to that. So basically from this general assumption or philosophy, uh, you know what, what we want to do is to design an algorithm that can first separate structural and non-structural distortions and di give different penalties. Right, so this is the most fundamental philosophy behind this structural similarity approach. And uh, based on this philosophy, actually, there could be many different ways to implement uh, some specific algorithms. And we do have um, <coughs> a few different ways to do this. Um, Okay, so I'm just uh, going to go a little bit uh, about one of the approaches. So this actually give you an example by what I mean by structural and non-structural distortions, right? So the, the top image is the original image. The left image is the non-structural distorted images. If you look at these images, you have luminance change, contrast change, gamma change, or you can shift image left and right by one pixel, half pixel. And in these cases, um, many of the time, you don't even notice the difference. And for some other time, you notice there's, yeah, there's no, some difference, but I don't care, right? So this, uh, this luminance or contrast change a little bit. I still extract the same structural information from the image. But you can imagine if I compute mean squared error, I take one of the image, subtract from the original, you're going to get huge errors, right? But these are the errors that you don't care, right? On the other hand, the right-hand side, you have these uh, structural distortions, you have blur, a blurred image, you have noise, you have compression. For well, these images, if you look at these images, really affect me to extract some useful information from the, from the scene, right? The face is not clear to me anymore. This is really annoying, right? So the point is that even though the left images and right images, if you compute the total error in, in terms of L2, they might be very similar to each other, but the visual system don't think that way. So this is the major purpose, why we need to separate structural and non-structural distortions. And we have some specific ways to do this, and um, unfortunately, I think this goes to too much details. And we're going to skip this particular algorithm of implementing this. Um, instead, I'm, I'm going to go straight show, showing you the equation of the structural similarity index, which, which is also the most popular uh, in the field. So in, in this case, uh, the I, I go to the very end, the algorithm part. In this case, you have the original image, you have the distorted image, you use a sliding window, which goes across the whole image. At each location, you've got two patches to compare with, and then you compute, basically compute the structural similarity index. It's somehow, after several stages of, of simplification, in the end, you simply just compute that on the top. It's very, very straightforward and simple. Right, so after that, you got one number, the one for each location in the image. You put that number into something what we call the quality map, because that number is supposed to tell you the quality of that specific patch in the image. You put all these numbers together, you got this quality map. And this quality map is supposed to predict uh, local quality. And then in the end, you have some pooling approach to, to, to merge this map into one number. You can imagine that the simplest method is to average the quality map 
but we do have a lot of approaches to do something smarter than simple averaging. Uh, but this uh, will go to a huge literature again. Um, but, it, but you got the general idea from this already. Okay, so this gives you a, a specific example. So in this case, the right image is the original image. The left image is created by adding uniform noise. When I say uniform, I mean mm -hmm. I add noise, uh, white Gaussian noise equally to every location in that image. But, but if you look at this image, it doesn't look like the noise is uniform because the face area is really annoying, very noisy. But on the other hand, how about the textures right there? Don't feel like that's uh, like a huge, really, really that bad distortion. Right? But you can imagine if I use L2, mean squared error, or basically any LP norm to compute the error, one subtract the other, you, you, you basically get the noise back, right? So no matter how you do this afterwards, you're going you're gonna to say everywhere the distortion is the same because, it's just the, because the noise is uniform. So what you really need is something, called, uh, something like this uh, SSIM index map. Here, darker means worse quality. So in, in, the, in, the, in the face area, it's, it's, it's bad because it's pretty dark. In the texture area, it's pretty bright. So it really gives you much better correlation uh, with uh, your eyes. And this gives you another example. This is uh, JPEG compression. The top left image, if you look at the image, what's bad about image, you can easily see the blocking artifacts in the sky and probably something funny at, at the boundary of this, this building, right? But if you use mean squared error, subtract this image from the original one, you're going to see the bottom right. So here, again, darker means bigger error, but just that in, in ab absolute error, map, error sense. Right? So this is basically telling you uh, inside this building, the quality is really bad in the, in the L2 sense. Right? So this is not right, right? So if you look at the top left image, Inside building, it looks uh, relatively okay compared with the other area of the image. Then you can imagine if, if I'm doing image compression, for example, I have already got this top left image and I'm allocating more bits to use in order to improve the quality of image. Where I'm going to throw those, those bits to improve the quality of image? If you use uh, mean squared error as a guide, you're going to throw more bits into the the inside of this building, which is exactly the wrong direction because it's already pretty good compared with the other areas. So what you really want is uh, the bottom left uh, structure similarity map. It tells you the blocking artifact is, is dark, is you have problem, the, the boundary of this building, you have problems. Right? So this actually gives you a good motivating example. Uh, if you have a good uh, image quality assessment tool, uh, what you, uh, how are you going to use it? Right, you can use it to predict quality, but you don't want to stop there. You also want, want to use that to optimize algorithms, for example, optimize image compression. Okay, coming back to the original um, example, here you, you have this mean structure similarity. Uh, the top two images are getting much higher scores than the bottom images. Of course, you can, this algorithm is something that we published more than 10 years ago. Uh, over the years, people have, have been trying to improve it. You can always improve those algorithms, but uh, these um, algorithms um, become more popular, I think, uh, for two reasons. Why is, at the time we proposed this, this is extremely different from any, any existing stuff at that time. The second thing is, it's very simple to compute, right? So it, it's kind of disruptive um, method at that time, and it works pretty well. And there are some more reasons. Uh, hopefully, I can spend a little bit more time to explain that uh, later. Okay, so the title of this talk is so What's Beyond? The, the major focus is What's Beyond? We don't want to spend too much time talking about the past. What's Beyond, right? So um, having said we have all these achievements in terms of image quality assessment in the past 10 years, what, what can we do next? And actually, I, the, the, the general comments I want to put on this is that we're still at a very, very early starting point of this area of uh, Im perceptual image quality assessment because there are so many things that haven't been resolved. What we have already resolved is a very tiny proportion of this. Right? So one thing is you can always improve accuracy, right? so you can always uh, improve speed, 
And, uh, but there are also other problems that uh, are not really, uh, not only uh, we want to improve the, uh, improve the performance, but also the existing methods don't even apply. So for example, um, how about these in extended in intensity levels? How about the HDR images? Right, so what if the reference image is, uh, has high dynamic range and the test image has low dynamic range? So this is a very typical case in computer, computer vision in these days. A lot of images, you capture those images, uh, you use multi-exposure approaches, you merge that images into high dynamic range images. But in most of these places, you, you, uh, you cannot show the images with HDR monitor. Most of the case, you have to use a, a regular size monitor to do this. And then basically in this case, you can imagine the test image is going to have a regular uh, dynamic range. Uh, the, the reference image has much higher dynamic range. Mean squared error or structural similarity, this method don't even apply. Right? So there are also other things like, so for example, what, what if the reference image and distorted images have different resolution? People do these scaling kind of things all, all the time. Right? So also uh, different, different video will have different frame rate how you're going to compare images with different frame rate. Right? So there are also other things. So for example, like this multi, uh, the, the thing I mentioned, multi-exposure fusion applications. What if the reference image, you have a stack of images uh, other than one. In the end, you, you fuse them into one image. The test image is going to be one. The, the reference image, you have a lot of images. You have a sequence of images. How you do quality assessment in these cases? Right, so we can keep keep doing this, uh, we can have a very, very long list of uh, what, what's beyond. So we also have extended uh, types of images. What about these, uh, most of the time we work with graphical, uh, natural images. What about the graphical images? What, what about screen content uh, images? What about artworks and so on, right? So these are new challenges uh, in, in the field. What about the, pur the final purpose is not how humans think about the quality, it's about the accuracy um, of pattern recognition uh, and, and tracking all these other applications. What about the, the medical field uh, of this? And what, kind of, what, what about um, quality assessment for um, uh, communication networks, communications? In, in this case, you have these transmission errors and, and, uh, 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 and people are looking at uh, image and video at a different viewing device. For example, the same video uh, if you show that on a, on a smartphone or show that on a big TV, the experience, human experience, quality of experience is going to be very, very different. But all these existing video quality assessment approaches will give you exactly the same number because the same, it is the same video content. So how are we going to do quality assessment of all these? Uh, these are many, many ch uh, challenging prob problems. Um, okay, other than that, uh, other than that uh, the, um, Another thing that I want to uh, put more emphasis on is that, um, as I said before, we don't want to stop at image quality assessment because the value of image quality assessment is not go only going to be quality monitoring and comparisons of algorithms and systems. We, this is good. It's good to be aware of uh, image quality after you process it, but the more interesting thing is that once you know this metric, how you're going to evaluate the quality of images, it's going to be more interesting if you use this quality metric to guide the algorithm, the design and optimization of this algorithm. I think this is the, 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 the major area that you can, you can expect a much bigger value of, of this image quality research. Of course, to do this, you have a lot of challenges. Uh, you want this, um, for example, I'm going to skip this. So you basically can make a wish list of the quality metric you want to have because you want to optimize that. That's the reason, the reason is because you want to optimize that. Uh, it has to be simple or low cost. You don't want to compute that. Uh, this, this is true. In old days, people designed chips and, and very expensive experiment just to, uh, uh, equipment just to do video quality assessment. Uh, people cannot afford that, uh, not to say optimize using that. So you want this to be very simple and low cost. You also want, uh, want several nice mathematical properties. You want this to be a, a, a very distant metric in order to analyze the, the performance of your iterative or optimization algorithm. You want this method to be um, invariant under orthogonal transform, like uh, uh, YDCT, Fourier, this type of transform are so popular. 
uh, because it has very nice orthogonal uh, invariant property and orthogonal transforms. When you analyze the errors in the transform domain and the original spatial domain, you're going to get exactly the same error. You also want this method to be differentiable. You also want some nice convexity property of this uh, problem. And this actually explains why this L2 norm, even though everybody is blaming that, why it's still the most popular one, uh, even up to now. The re reason is that L2 basically says it's all these nice properties. You, can, you cannot even imagine anything that could be ever better than L2 if you talk about optimization. The only thing that L2 doesn't have is doesn't predict perceptual quality. Okay, so then the question is, is, is structural similarity or any other metric also satisfy this? Uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to satisfy all these conditions other than L2, but we, do it, we did a lot of um, mathematical analysis of the structural similarity. It is actually, in many sense, close to that, right? So, for example, you can split structural similarity into several pieces. Each one of them is actually a, di a very distant metric, and uh, these are too much. There are some nice uh, properties in terms of invariance and so on. And you also have uh, some kind of good uh, convexity problem. It is basically not convex, but it is quasi-convex uh, in the sense that its, it's level set is convex. Uh, and also it's locally convex in, in the sense that if you're already very close to global optimal, you are actually in an area that's convex. So um, there are some, uh, this is the, the level set and so on. So uh, finally, I, I think uh, I don't want to spend too much time because I really want to give uh, Han Tao a little bit more time. This is actually give you, giving you one example how we can use these uh, structures, uh, why this structure similarity has this nice property that can, you can make use of so that you can do some uh, interesting optimization work. So in this case, I'm thinking about every image as one point in, in high dimensional space. So for example, you have a, Image that, image that has a million pixels, that you can imagine for any particular image is just one point in this one million dimensional space. Okay, imagine we're in this kind of a space. We start from a particular image with just one point in the middle, and then we kick out by adding some noise. Right? So we create, create an image, initial image like that, and then you can imagine for all the images that have exactly the same mean squared error compute with the, the reference image, it's going to be uh, simply a hypersphere in this one million dimensional space. Okay, suppose we're, we're doing this, then what we are doing here right now is that we start from this initial image, we use the iterative uh, gradient-based optimization method, basically it's a constrained gradient uh, 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 optimization method because we want to constrain us on, to, on this hypersphere, right? So we, but, but we do uh, two things. One is we keep improving the structural similarity index. Of course, we are keeping mean squared error. And then we keep doing this using iterative uh, optimization such that in the end we converge to some images. I got something on the, on the top. On the other hand, I can keep decreasing the structural similarity and until the algorithm converge, then I got something at the bottom. So basically, everything along this line, they have the same mean squared error compared with the reference image but the perceptual quality, you can see that the top one has the highest structural similarity, the bottom one has the lowest structural similarity, and this image is not handmade, it's generated from the algorithm, that's the, the fun part about this. Okay, you can do this uh, more, and this is the same thing, and um, again, initial image, uh, you're trying to improve the uh, structural similarity, you're trying to, trying to decrease structural similarity, you got these uh, pictures, and some people say, okay, this is not fair uh, because you are using structural similarity to mess up with mean squared error. How about the other one? So how about keeping the structural similarity the same? You try to minimize and, and, and the mean squared error to get better quality. That's what you get. The lab image is to keep structural similarity. You try to improve mean squared error. That one has the lowest mean squared error, meaning that it has highest quality in terms of the same structural similarity. And that one has, the, the right one has the lowest um, uh, structural similarity uh, with the same mean squared error. And of course, all of the, all, actually all three images looks uh, pretty bad, but I, I would guess nobody would say the left image has the highest quality. Uh, you can keep doing this. Right, so I think we spend too much, uh, I'm gonna spend too much time giving more examples, but I just show you final results. So basically we are, 
also design methods, uh, quality assessment methods for evaluating uh, tone map images. So basically, the reference image is going to be the HDR image. Uh, the, the testing image, test image is the tone mapped LDR image, how we're going to do quality assessment. And based on that, we did some optimization similar to what we are doing right here. Similar approach, of course, the specific algorithm would be a little bit complicated, but um, we, we can simply do this. And uh, in the end, we got result like this. Initial image like this, we can, we can start from uh, an algorithm that, are, that is already producing pretty OK uh, tone mapping result. But it's not perfect, because if you look at this picture, uh, the details inside the, the, the very bright window is a lot. Also, the details at this dark region, actually, there is detail, because you can see uh, the other final image we got. And after all these iterations, so first, our algorithm is telling you where the problem of this picture is. You see darker region has lower quality. And then over the iterations, it's getting brighter and brighter and brighter. In the end, you got a picture like this. This one will show you all the details in that image. Right, so we also did this with uh, multi-exposure fusion. That's going to be a lot, another image quality assessment algorithm. Another algorithm to optimize uh, this new metric uh, using these iterative uh, approaches. And um, OK, so. And uh, I'm giving you final two example. So uh, using this optimization iterative algorithm, we start from this initial image. It really looks really bad. Right? So by applying our approach using this gradient-based method, we do these iterations. And after 10 iterations, after 30 iterations, 50 iterations, after 100 iterations, you end up with something pretty good. So basically, in this huge space uh, of images, uh, you start from any point, basically something really far away from optimal, you, you will converge to an image like this. And you, of course, you can also start from a very good point. right? So you can look at the existing, um, uh, like in this case, multi-exposure fusion algorithms. This is one of the, the best, based on our subjective testing, this is uh, probably the best um, uh, multi-exposure algorithm uh, we, we have. And then, but we can, we can use this method as a starting point. We can still apply our iterative algorithm. And you can see we can uh, further improve this result, like the, the, the bright area here. You can see more details and so on. Right. So this gives you uh, some initial example about how uh, we don't want to stop at evaluating image quality, but uh, instead we want to use this uh, image quality metric to optimize the existing algorithms so that you can produce uh, better results in the end. So I think I'm going to stop here. Hopefully I'm, I'm not taking too much time. Yeah, thank you.